Welcome everyone to today's webinar. I am Brian Zimmerman with Becker Software Review. We'll begin today's webinar with a presentation and we'll have time at the end of the hour for a question and answer session. You can submit any questions you have throughout the webinar by typing them into your control panel in the space labeled enter a question for staff and clicking send. We're looking forward to hearing your question. Today's session is being recorded and will be available after the event. In about a week following the webinar, we will be sending all registrants a copy of the presentation to the email you used to register. At this time, it is now my pleasure to start today's webinar by introducing our presenter. Scott Woodard is Director of Analytics for Lidus Health. Scott has spent the last 10 plus years in healthcare consulting and executive management. In his career, he has worked with over 50 clients nationally and internationally in developing strategic plans, performing asset realization, total cost of ownership, and using data to drive performance. As Director of Analytics in the Solutions Management Group for Lidos Health, Scott has led initiatives to bring creative solutions to clients through innovation and data-driven strategies, improving operational performance. As Chief Operating Officer for an outpatient revenue cycle firm, Scott directed strategic planning efforts leading to a two-fold increase in revenue and a reduction in cost through automation of services. Scott holds a BA from Trinity University in San Antonio and an MBA from the University of Texas. At this time, I am pleased to turn the floor over to Scott to begin today's presentation. I appreciate it, Brian. Thank you very much. Uh, good morning, good afternoon, good lunch uh, to everyone. Uh, once again, uh, my name is Scott Woodard. I'm the Director of Analytics with Lidos Health. And I know a handful of people uh, on the call, and, and so you know I'm going to begin talking a little bit about a data point as sort of a frame of reference, right? So I am a larger guy. I'm, I'm 6'2", 245, and my wife is tiny. Uh, God, rest, God bless her soul. She's a 4'11", she weighs about 95 pounds, and I have three tiny kids. So in my family, uh, I am obviously the biggest person there is. And so if I want to improve in terms of becoming stronger or losing weight or whatever, right, I have a long way to go to get to my family's size and weight. If I look within my bigger family, so my wife's sisters, they actually married guys that are bigger than me. Uh, Elizabeth's dad, my wife's dad's bigger than me. And so if I look at myself within that framework, I'm doing okay, right? I'm kind of right in the middle. Uh, I haven't changed at all. So my personal data hasn't changed. However, the information that I have has changed. And then when I go get a physical uh, and my primary care physician says that I am healthy as a relatively overweight horse, well, then I have another perspective, right? Again, I haven't changed, uh, but the data, the information has changed around me. And so we're gonna talk a little bit about that, right? How do we turn data into useful information as a reference point, as a way to improve our organizations overall, uh, in terms of cost and length of stay and quality, how do we, how do we drive revenue? So, from an agenda standpoint, we're going to just talk a little bit about uh, introduction. We're going to look at business challenges in the market that we are seeing uh, at Lidos Health. We're going to look at establishing that normalized data. So, what I talked about in terms of the frame of reference, right? We want to make sure that we are looking at ourselves nationally within peer groups that that make sense that are rational to us uh, so that we can make very very impactful and good decisions uh, every time we look at data then we're gonna look at how do we identify the opportunity within that normalized data set and how do we create the sustainable change that that information really provides to us so you've probably seen charts like this one and like the next one I'm gonna show, but it's really an idea of, you know, the United States falls way off the charts uh, in terms of, of these types of things, right? Health spending per capita at the bottom, life expectancy in years on the left. Uh, we're not that much better at extending our lives, but we sure are spending a lot of money on it. And the same goes with this, right? This is actually healthcare expenditure on the left. So we're way up at the top in the big green dot and GDP per capita. So, you know, how well or how rich uh, essentially is our country? And, you know, again, way off the chart here. So, so what's the real problem we're trying to deal with 
or trying to solve today. And there's obviously a lot, right? Pharmaceutical costs and, and different things like that. But I think one thing is actually, we are not following the correct data, driving that into information and creating improvement across the board uh, in a quality and a cost sense. So we want to be able to put those things in a framework a lot better than we do today. So we can start to drive these charts and make them much more visually pleasing uh, to everybody in the United States. So what are we seeing from business challenges in the market around data, around information? Well, scorecards and metrics is one, right? Everybody's got a dashboard. Well, I got a dashboard for this and I got a dashboard for this, but are they really useful, right? Do they really tell me any information? Are they simply numbers that I'm trending and tracking? And am I looking inside my own four walls or am I easily able to look outside of my own four walls. How do we turn that data into actionable data, right? I, I, I don't want the data point of me being the largest person in my family. I don't want the data point of me being the smallest person. I want the actionable data that makes sense so that I can perform to the absolute best that I can possibly do. And then how do we begin to take prescriptive actions with that actionable data? So I'm turning that data into actually work breakdown structured activities that address the problems that I found with the information and carry those things through sustainable change. And then how do we begin to look at, so this is gonna be more external, right? How do we begin to look at marketing efforts? Are we actually one of the best performing hospital systems in our market? Do our patients know that? Do our providers know that? Uh, do the employers and payers in the area know that? And how do we start to tell them with more precise and certain data that we are the best performers so that they don't send their patients and so the patients don't go to other facilities that are lower performing in terms of either quality or cost? And that really plays into value-based care. So as we start to talk about alternative payment models, bundled payments, capitated payments, all those different types of things, which we'll actually talk about here in a minute. How do we look at that in terms of quality, in terms of that cost performance? Do we know ourselves as organizations from a value chain standpoint? Do I control when a patient comes in with knee pain, if they go see the MRI within my facility, if they go see the surgeon within my facility, if they go to post-acute rehab within my facility, or are there exit points that I don't control? And so it's an easy way to get into a bad value-based contract if they are leaving your system to do any of those things. And so understanding the cost structure of that value chain is extremely important and using normalized data to do that relative to the other performers in our market or in the nation is also very important. And then how do we deal with the payer community? Uh, I talked a little bit about it in the marketing stance where do the payers know how well I'm doing? Do they know how well I'm doing from a cost standpoint? Do they know how well I'm doing from a quality standpoint? Are they willing to start to take different alternative payment models with me that are advantageous to my system uh, if they understand the quality that I'm providing to the market? Here are a few key market trends that are impacting health system performance, right? So shifting demographics and chronic disease. There's a 38% increase in 65 plus US population between 2015 and 2025. So that is, we're kind of right in the middle of that. And as that population ages, there's going to be more complex health problems. Uh, we talk a lot about lifetime customer cost or, or lifetime patient cost. And obviously end of life or towards the end of your life is really where all of that cost is being spent. And so when we have such a giant bubble of people in this country that are getting older, we're gonna have to start understanding how to manage those more effectively from a cost and quality standpoint. 50% of Americans live with at least one chronic disease. So again, how are those managed from, you know, midlife to end of life, how do we keep those folks out of the hospital more often? And how do we understand what we can do as an organization to do that? 40% <clears throat> of health costs are estimated due, to be due to socioeconomic factors. And this goes to the point where there's a lot of data that rests outside of your EMR today. Uh, about 80% 
of a patient's data that impacts their personal health is outside of that, right? It's, it's uh, I, I live in a, an underserved area. I have not the greatest, um, I live in a food desert, and right? I don't have the greatest access to healthy food. So all these different types of things, and how do organizations start to cope with all of that type of data and turn it into information that's useful? Market consolidation, right? We, we all hear about U.S. healthcare M&A transactions. You know, we're, we're up uh, the last couple of years uh, in terms of those. How do our organizations make that data that we get informational in those M&A transactions? So if I'm going to consolidate with a particular healthcare system, if I'm going to purchase a provider group or partner with a provider group for something that they do that I don't, what is the quality metrics or what are the quality metrics of those groups or of that facility that I need to look at to make sure that I know what I'm getting into? 86% um, of increase in hospital ownership for, of physician practices, right? We're starting to buy these points of entry uh, into our particular hospital system. That plays into what I talked about with the value chain, right? We're keeping patients inside the system as much as possible because that way we know exactly what we are spending on those particular services instead of the, you know, the unknown of when they leave our facility a, what happens from a quality standpoint, and B, what happens from a cost standpoint. From a clinical and operational efficiency standpoint, right, there's decreased reimbursement uh, from Medicare, uh, increased costs. I talked about it a little bit earlier with pharmacy costs being, you know, out of this world. Um, I heard a story this morning about a, a, a little kid that got bit by a copperhead snake at camp. Uh, they had to airlift the child to a hospital, gave him the anti-venom, and the parents got a bill for $140,000 because the venom alone was $55,000. That is a crazy, crazy cost uh, for pharmacy, which obviously puts pressure on hospital margins. And you have to sort of address that some way uh, in terms of making sure that your data is telling you where those cost points are and can you address them effectively. From a value-based reimbursement model standpoint, um, these are starting to emphasize improved care, right? So we're starting to see this quality become a piece of the argument that payers are making in terms of payments and in terms of driving traffic. And we'll talk a little bit about this later. And then the proliferation of connected devices, right? The internet of things, you know, how are all of these types of smartphones and smartwatches and devices within the hospital starting to be connected through, you know, the internet or through the cloud or anything like that? So we're going to have a poll question here. Uh, this is interactive, right? A, you had to use your imagination. If you don't know me and you don't know what I look like and you don't know what my family looks like, and we're going to have to use our kind of interactive ability here in terms of the poll question. So what form of alternative payment models is your organization involved in? Um, so capitated payments, right? I'm taking a per member per month uh, on a particular service line or you know, globally, uh, I'm taking a bundled payment for knee replacements. I'm taking these population-based payments around chronic conditions and using risk adjustment models to do that. Or is my organization using multiple payment models? Or we haven't even talked about it. So let's um, just run through those real quick and we'll get the, uh, the results. Okay. So from a value-based payment adoption um, and maturity standpoint, this is really what we're starting to see in throughout the country is this some form of alternative payment models are being used by organizations. And so what this is saying is the dark blue there is established, right? So 47% so of organizations have established some sort of pay for performance 
41% have established some sort of capitation. Um, the green is the growing, uh, the darker bluish or, or darker aqua color there is the pilot, and then the light blue is kind of the planning piece. So really what this means is while it's growing in terms of adoption, it's actually only portions, right? So I will use one service line or one particular item from a capitation standpoint, or I will use one particular service line from a population health standpoint. So it's not global, right? It's not saying organizations are actually taking their entire revenue and driving it into capitated payments. But it is important to understand that they are beginning to grow, right? It's not mandated by the government, but organizations are starting to look at these types of things. And like I said before, if you don't understand the value chain and the cost and the quality of what you're providing, it's very possible to get into a bad value-based contract. How do we take the first steps to make that sustainable change? Well, we start to turn data into information, right? Here's another market trend that we're seeing. Um, so this comes from Quantros, which is a, an analytics firm, and they actually contract with large employers throughout the country uh, in using their uh, normalized quality data to say, okay, I am a multinational retailer in Texas. I have a lot of spine surgeries that happen. Um, I want to see the best quality performance for spine surgery in the country. Then I want to drive my million plus members to that particular facility. Uh, it's, it's kind of the way that Baylor Scott & White does it with uh, spine surgeries, and um, I believe Cleveland Clinic does it with uh, heart surgeries with certain employers. So those types of things are absolutely happening. And so, you know, quality is not just a we want to do it well, which we all obviously do. It's actually becoming a factor in uh, what uh, employers and payers choose and where they choose to send their participants. So from an EHR data and analytics, right, we talked about there's, there's not that much uh, that really pertains to a person's health, but what is in there is extremely important. It's extremely important to the care that they get, right, it's extremely important to their acute problems that are trying to be fixed. Uh, with procedures within the organizations. And so if I'm starting to look at it from an organization standpoint, do I have an integrated view within my walls? Can I see how I'm performing? So uh, as my story at the beginning, right, can I just get on the scale and look at myself? I have no um, frame of reference. I just know that if I step on the scale, I get a number. Can I do that from, uh, from my data within the EHR? And then how do I get a competitive view outside my walls. So how do I begin to, after I've stepped on the scale, check my frame of reference and say, okay, this is how I'm performing against a larger cohort, uh, peers within my market or peers nationally, and therefore I can find the opportunity that I need to improve on much quicker. Then I turn that piece of data into some more information, right? What does my relevant comparison look like? Okay, I'm actually a high cardiac specialty. I do a, a lot of joints. I have a high trauma. Um, I want, I'm a 300 to 500 bed hospital. How do I look, right? I want to start to see that within the framework again of my clinically and risk adjusted data from cost length of stay and quality so that I can better compare myself. And now I'm getting a nice full picture. Now I'm turning all that data into information so that I can actually take action on it, right? We do that by doing some risk and clinical adjustment. And so if I took your 300 bed facility and compared it to a 300 bed facility that's you know a thousand miles away, uh, you know, one in Des Moines and one in New York City. Those two things are very different, right? The patients you see are very different. The cost models are very different. The cost of living is very different. So there's a lot of things that go into, I'm just a 300 bed hospital and you are a 300 bed hospital, let's compare. And so how we need to look at it is from a risk and a clinical adjustment standpoint. So through a, a binary logistic regression, 
Action model. Uh, we actually take this through age, gender, chronic conditions, and significant comorbidities to give a composites quality score. And really all it's saying is, I expect uh, this patient with their age, gender, chronic conditions, and comorbidities to have this particular mortality or this particular complication rate for this procedure. And the actual uh, of what happened to that patient then gets a score based on that expectation and it's normalized across the country. So uh, you can't say my patients are sicker, uh, uh, you know, I see the worst of the worst. It's really saying, yeah, okay, I get that. We are recognizing that you see the, the worst of the worst, but we are also recognizing that the prevalence of a mortality event or a complication or a readmission is higher or lower than we expected to, to happen. And then from a cost and a, and a length of stay, right, we're going to look at the severity, intensity, and complexity of that patient. And so when I start to talk about opportunity here in a little bit, you really want to be able to say, uh, what's the severity, right? What did we do? What's the intensity of that particular patient in terms of age? And then what's the complexity? How many uh, chronic conditions or comorbidities did they come in with so that I, I am looking at the utilization of my resources? You know, those things are weighted. Um, it, it, it gets this very, very accurate R squared that says, okay, if I looked at the national average for a performer in, you know, DRG 470, they are at X dollars, I am at Y dollars, and the difference there times the number of cases is really what my opportunity is. And so balancing that data, normalizing that data, putting it in a, a reference point that is relevant to your organization is critical in getting that information in terms of using resources wisely to impact the organization. You know, the, the real optimization piece um, within healthcare is typically in a silo, right? I am, I am a clinical optimization. I'm going to do this in the clinical realm. I'm going to do this in the revenue cycle realm. But really, patients get seen across those areas, right? They don't come in for their knee surgery and get seen in clinical, and then they get the revenue cycle, and then they get the supply chain, and then they get the ambulatory. It's really a, a single procedure that happens across the board. And so what your organization has to learn how to do is to break those silos and using the data to give you the information behind the ability to do that makes it much easier to create sustainable change. If you work within a silo, uh, I think I have a revenue cycle problem. Well, you might fix that problem, but the upstream and the downstream effects of that change aren't really gonna be nearly as impactful if you looked at it across the continuum. And instead of saying, I have a revenue cycle problem, you can say, I have a major orthopedic surgery problem. Okay, well, what does that mean? Let's look at clinical, let's look at rev cycle, let's look at supply chain, let's look at the ambulatory piece of it. Let's look at how our physicians are performing uh, in terms of quality in uh, major orthopedic surgery, and then let's look at the cost. And now we've wrapped all of that together. From a global look, we've looked at each of those areas within that service line so that that change is extremely sustainable. So we have another poll question here. Um, where does your team access normalized data to establish priorities? And uh, if you don't do it, obviously NA. So I just put a couple um, kind of things that we hear in the market out there, right? Truven Health Analytics or Premier or Vizient. Uh, if you use other, um, that's certainly fine. Uh, you can select that now.
Okay, perfect. So, so when we turn data into information, we begin to use that information to identify opportunity. So this was a, an interesting quote uh, that I saw in the 2019 Healthcare CFO Outlook, which was by um, Kaufman Hall. And they said, 94% of CFOs said that they have experienced increased pressure to have more insight into how financial results impact business strategy. However, these executives lack confidence in their ability to utilize data to support actionable, informed decision-making in a quickly evolving environment. And so really what that means to me is I can, as a CFO, look at a P&L, probably down to the service line level, and say, I'm underperforming in cardiac care. I'm underperforming in major orthopedic surgery. But that doesn't tell me where the problem really is, right? It just gives me two numbers, and it just doesn't put them in a framework that I can really understand what I need to do to fix that problem. If I'm losing money on every case, increased volume is not going to help me. Uh, if I'm making money on cases, I do need to increase volume. How do I do that? Uh, if my quality is poor, I'm not going to be able to increase the volume of cases because the market understands that my quality is poor. Um, if I'm the best, right? how do I make sure that the market knows that so I can increase that volume? So these are all the questions that you can ask yourself as a CFO when you see an underperforming P&L that's just a data point. And so what we want organizations to understand is that giving much more framework or giving much more relevancy to that data helps make those decisions. And so when we look at performance from a cost uh, and from a length of stay standpoint, you really can see clearly where the impactful opportunities are. You know, we will hear in the market, I think I have a problem in pulmonary care, um, you know, the P&L looks bad, the volume's low, you know, whatever that may be. And the answer could quite possibly be, yes, you do have a problem in pulmonary care. And in fact, for this particular example here, pulmonary care is fifth on the list. But as you can see, there's way bigger problems, right? There's way more opportunity in four other areas. And so if you are ignoring the data, and the information that's created from it, and you are just going by gut feeling or by a single data point, you would spend a lot of resources on pulmonary care, fixing whatever's going on there, uh, and you would be missing the real impactful opportunities. So as you normalize this clinically and risk adjusted data to say your performance versus the national average gives you the greatest impact of opportunity in actually here cardiac care and major cardiac surgery. Okay, so these are, those are the types of things that we talk about when we're turning that data into information. From a clinical quality performance standpoint, we're looking at this from a national view, right? So this particular facility here, Hospital 2, is in the 99.9th percentile in overall hospital quality. And if you look within the market, this is a very good market, right? They're actually very good performing hospitals uh, in this particular peer group. And so if I'm Hospital 2, I'm going out to the market to say, why is anyone else sending uh, their patients otherwhere, other places for cardiac care? Specifically, if I'm hospital number three, I'm really got an argument around cardiac surgery, right? If I've got splitters, I'm going to take this information to my splitter physicians and say, look, we're 20 points or we're 12 points better than second place and 20 points better than third place in our particular market from a quality performance standpoint. How are you sending patients? To other facilities. I'm going to take this to employers and payers and say, look how much better I am. So I'm starting to now create both ends of the spectrum. I looked at cost, 
uh, and reducing length of stay on the previous slide. I look at how well I'm performing from a quality standpoint on this slide. I'm driving revenue here. I'm cutting cost. That opportunity then flows to the bottom line much faster. And again, you can't do this without taking that data and turning it into the information that says from an expected value, right? I'm not, I'm not seeing sicker patients. That doesn't make my score lower. I'm actually seeing the patients they're expecting to see and the outcomes that are expected to happen. And I'm actually overperforming on those. Then we look at this, right? So, so this is kind of the, the piece of that where we're talking about that market share growth. So I'm going to take the information that I'm the best in orthopedic surgery, I'm the best in cardiac surgery, and I'm going to say I'm, I'm really only doing 20% uh, in cardiac. I'm doing about 30% in orthopedic surgery. That's pretty good. But how do I get those things up? And really that impacts my bottom line by, or my top line in this case by a million dollars, right? There's much more opportunity here to say, I'm the best, let me have more volume. And as we dive further in to the quality performance, I really love these charts because this really shows you where the problems are. This is the, in, this is the actual beauty of turning data into information, right? Each of these points in terms of patient safety or complications or readmissions are all simple data points. But when I put them in the framework of my relative performance, I now have information. So I can say, even if I am, you know, 95th percentile in joint replacement in terms of quality, I'm in the 50th percentile in terms of complications in my joint replacements. How do I begin to fix that? right? I have, a, I have a pretty good patient safety problem here. I don't have a readmissions problem. So if someone comes at me and says, hey, we need to fix readmissions, I could say, well, actually, you're performing better. Now, we actually had a client that said, well, you know, Scott, you, you're telling us that we actually don't have a length of stay problem, but we have projects that we're working on uh, in length of stay. You know, our, our length of stay is five days. We're trying to get it to 4.6 days. And I said, okay, but that is a geometric mean length of stay, okay? If I clinically adjust your length of stay, it actually should be 5.6 and you are at 5.0. And so you are outperforming what you should be doing today. So getting to 4.6 is spinning your tires on things that you don't need to. There's, there's much more opportunity in other areas because you're already outperforming where you should be and getting to some random 4.6 geometric mean number is not gonna happen unless you put a lot of horsepower behind it and it's not gonna impact the organization that much. And so that's turning that data into information. We really wanna look at these four key performance drivers, right? So, so we're looking here at the um, Service lines on the left, right, we've kind of talked about this, cardiac surgery, neurological surgery, all those types of things. Then from a clinical portfolio standpoint, how do we begin to look at market share impacts, which we've talked um, a lot about uh, here today? How do we look at the revenue yield, right? What are the revenue impacts created by improving performance within the, those service lines? Cost, how can we generate margin improvement? And again, you know, when, when you look at this from a physician performance standpoint, there's going to be variation in that within service lines. So if I've got 25 spine surgeons and they all do 25 you know, different types of spine surgeries or different types of devices and use different pharmacy uh, utilization for each of them, that's going to affect the quality and the cost, even within that one service line. And so how can we generate those mar margin improvements just by standardizing care and using the information that we have? And then from a care delivery standpoint, what's the impact of improving that quality, right? Are we starting to keep folks out of the hospital with their chronic conditions by managing their medications or managing their treatment further outside the organization so that we are reducing cost and therefore uh, increasing capacity uh, could be a big one, right? Reducing that length of stay and increasing capacity as you keep folks out of the hospital and reducing costs from that long-term uh, patient cost standpoint. So I'll have our last poll question here. Of the following, 
which is currently the most pressing issue your organization is facing today. Prioritization of projects. So uh, a lot of organizations we run into say, you know, we have a, a method of prioritizing, but really it's a uh, person that raises their hand or person that puts the project in front of someone who's making that decision uh, gets their project done. So is that, a, is that a pressing challenge your organization has today? Uh, cost reduction, right? That's probably forefront on, on everyone's mind from even a, um, a fee for service uh, or a fee for performance uh, type of environment. Technology rationalization, right? We're starting to, from an M&A activity, we're starting to acquire, we're starting to partner with other organizations. They have duplicate technology that we have. How do those things get rationalized? Uh, how do we sunset some things? How do we uh, start to understand the legacy data? Where does that go uh, in terms of that technology rationalization? Or EMR implementations and go lives. You know, that's a, a lower um, type of, of process that's going on today, right? And the, the market's fairly saturated with new EMRs. But in terms of acquisitions, um, you know, we still see facilities changing uh, EMRs as well and going live onto new systems. Um, you know, while it's a lower kind of percentile uh, project that goes on, it's obviously extremely uh, heavy lift for organizations. And then other, if you guys have other projects that are going on that are actually pressing in terms of um, you know, your organization. Okay, so we'll sort of, we'll, we'll wrap up um, here just in terms of how do we support sustainable change um, throughout our organizations. Right, we want to look at that clinically and risk adjusted data to derive opportunity for improvement. Right, if I just looked at myself uh, within the framework of my larger family, I would think that I'm doing fine. Uh, if I go to a physician and look at myself within the framework of my age, my height, and my weight, I get a much different picture and I want to be able to use that picture to help me know where I need to improve. We will utilize data analytics and more clearly define cost, quality, and length of stay uh, and increase revenue opportunities. And so when you're looking at this holistically within your organization, you wanna make sure you're hitting both sides of the equation. How is my cutting of cost or my increase of quality going to affect volume? Uh, how, how can I both cut cost and increase revenue? Um, you want to be able to further refine the analysis of that data and information uh, into some view of physician performance. So you wanna look at high contributors to length of stay and cost opportunities. You want to look at high contributors from a uh, quality uh, opportunity. We talked with one CMIO and he said, yeah, I, I get some of this internal data and I can say, okay, you know, I do have 20 physicians and they are kind of performing all over the board in terms of quality. But if they are, you know, high performing as an organization, that can self-correct, right? Uh, the physicians might talk to each other. Well, what are you doing here that I'm not doing here? Why is your quality number higher than mine? But if all of the physicians are below a national average in terms of performance, how do I raise that tide? And the only way to do that is to be able to look outside your four walls in terms of performance and put it in that relative framework so that you know that the whole organization needs to improve, not just a few doctors within a particular service line. You wanna align that value to your strategic initiatives. So if I have um, an overall business goal of increasing market share in a particular service line, I better understand what the market looks like in terms of that service line. Uh, are there physicians outside of my organization that are performing at a high level that I might want to partner with or I might want to acquire or hire? 
um, so that my strategic initiatives from a business standpoint are actually being pushed forward and supported by the information that's created from the data. And then you wanna be able to prioritize uh, the remediation and the implementation efforts. So we talked a little bit about, I think I have a problem in pulmonary care, but my actual problem was in cardiac care. So you wanna be able to understand the impact of those things so that you can deploy the resources to the correct areas and prioritize what's going to be most impactful, what do I have time to do, and do I have the resources on hand today to actually do those things that are going to be impactful. And all the while, you're letting the data drive you, you're letting that data in, in, be pulled into your organization turning it into information and driving that opportunity. So I think we'll have um, a question and answer session. And uh, Brian, if you wanna kind of take over this piece. Yeah, thank you, Scott, for that excellent presentation. Uh, we will now begin today's question and answer session. Please submit any questions you have by typing them into your control panel in the space labeled enter a question for staff and clicking send. We'll go ahead and get started here. So I understand prioritizing and understanding effort, but how did you determine which areas to begin the prioritization process around? Yeah, you know, good question. I think um, the, the key point to that is, is what we talked about around the normalization of data, right? So if you just go with the gut, and say, all right, you know, I've got this, or if you've got a very influential physician in your organization that says, well, we, we need to have a, a length of stay or a readmission discussion uh, around XYZ service line, right, you're missing the impactful opportunities. So using that normalized data and putting it in that framework or that, that reference point of how the nation is performing or how your specific region or how your specific market is performing allows you to find those most impactful areas and helps you to prioritize what you're going to deploy your resources on. Great, thank you for that clarification. And so this audience member wants to know, which pieces of data do you think are most important for organizations to try and identify? Well, you know, I, I think, um, you know, we, we talk a lot about cost quality and length of stay. So you hit a couple of things with those particular items and it gives you a general sense of where the problems are. Um, the more specific sense would come as you dive into that, right? So you have, you have created this opportunity or you have um, identified this opportunity and then you dive further into it um, around supply costs, right? Am I adhering to particular supply contracts? Am I utilizing the size of my organization in contracting for specific supplies? Do I have uh, physicians that are ordering non-stock or non-standard items? Um, you know, are they putting devices in but not charging for them because they are outside of the inventory list? You know, there's a lot of specific data points um, that you're going to look at from a performance improvement standpoint that are really important. But the opportunity impact is actually going to be generated from a higher level, and then when you do find those areas of improvement, you have to have the quality numbers to back it up, right? So really you're not going to ever have a conversation with a physician around cost, right? I'm just going to do this to reduce cost. That's not an effective conversation. It's not an effective way of doing business, right? Just to cut costs for no reason. So you wanna have that quality information as well uh, in order to have those conversations with physicians, okay, look, uh, you and Physician Smith over there are performing at $5,000 difference in your knee replacements. However, his quality is 25 percentage points better than yours. So let's fix the delta there. What are you using from a device standpoint or a process standpoint that is creating so much more cost and keeping that quality uh, at a low level? 
thank you, Scott. Some helpful in insights there about uh, communicating with physicians. And so our next question I have here is, how sophisticated must our organization be in terms of analytical capabilities to accomplish these strategies? You know, I don't, I don't think it's a, a sophistication problem. P most of the problems that I see are, um, you know, culture or change management problems, right? This is not going to work because it's not sustainable. We can't get the organization behind it. And so that's a real key problem for, or a key opportunity, I should say, for leaders to get behind this to say, I have empirical data that shows uh, we need to improve in cost and quality, and therefore we're going to do this uh, as an organization. You know, CMOs, CMIOs uh, have the opportunity to say, I have underperforming physicians and now I know who they are, all right? And I have that empirical data uh, that I'm showing them uh, that says, look, the information's right here, right? Y you are underperforming in terms of a national percentile in quality. Uh, that may be a coding problem. It may, it may not be you. Um, it may be several things, but we want to be able to dive into it. And so the sophistication really comes from leadership being willing to get behind the changes that need to be made in order to improve quality uh, or reduce cost. Thank you, Scott. And so we've got an attendee here who wants to know about getting started. So this uh, attendee asked, so how do I get started? How do I get this data compared to peers in order to make these informed decisions? Sure. So um, we actually uh, get it through uh, claims data, right? It, we use Medicare UBO4 claims data uh, that comes in. It's uh, processed through an algorithm that is peer reviewed and validated that does the clinical and risk adjustment. And then we actually come up with the opportunity based on those types of things. So there are certainly several analytics firms out there that do that. Um, we feel that the way you know, we get it done is kind of more precise uh, and, you know, utilizing that sort of discover uh, technique of finding the real problems after the directional problems have been identified uh, is very helpful. So I listed a few of the analytics firms on one of the poll questions. You know, they certainly have data. Uh, you know, we feel ours is, is great. So um, I'm happy to talk to you after this if, if you'd like. Fantastic. And so the next question we have here is, what is the biggest issue facing organizations in finding this data? Yeah, you know, I think the um, the biggest issue is my data is better than yours, right? On some level, um, there is a there is a proliferation of this data out there. Um, you know, we talked about our our data being very, very high in R-square, which means it's extremely relevant in terms of performance and what that data means. Um, I heard a, um, I don't remember who was a CEO or a physician at the Becker's conference in Chicago uh, that said, there are only about 20% of the hospitals that are on the U.S. News and World Report top 100, and they are also on top of, you know, leapfrog ratings, and they are also on top of CMS star ratings. So how is that possible? How could someone end up on a top 100 list and not on the other lists, or vice versa, right? How are you going to end up at the top of a leapfrog list and not on the top 100 list? And so there is a lot of fear around um, data and how relevant it is. Um, and so I would say those types of um, methodologies are more subjective. Um, I feel like U.S. News and World Report gets a little bit of a, a popularity contest. Once I'm on the list, I'm sort of always on the list uh, type of thing. It's not terribly clinically or risk adjusted in a precise manner. And so when you are looking at data, you want to make sure that it's giving you the most precise information that you can possibly get. Great. I think that's a fantastic place to sort of bookend this Q&A conversation. But, Scott, I want to throw it back to you and see if you have any final thoughts you'd like to leave our audience with today. No, I think, you know, 
as we begin to to talk about in the industry, and this is another thing I heard uh, on a Becker's panel was uh, clinical services rationalization. So in Chicago, for instance, there's Rush, and then across the street or, or, or half a mile away, and there's Presence Hospital, and they both do cardiac care, and they both do all these different things. You know, that is not a great model for healthcare in general. And so when we talk about turning data into information or when we talk about improving quality or access to care or reducing costs or all these things that are trying to improve healthcare as a whole, we need to begin to understand how we perform within a market. And so if there's something that I don't do well, uh, is there an organization I can partner with that does it better? Is that going to help my patients in some manner? Uh, ease of access or you know better care, all of those different types of things um, that we're going to begin looking at in terms of global health care. And so I, I urge your organizations to certainly look at relevant data, turning that data into information uh, from a relevant standpoint and a framework standpoint um, that can help you to rationalize these clinical services and deliver better care to all consumers. Thank you, Scott, for sharing your insights today. And thank Lidos House for sponsoring today's webinar. Enjoy you, the rest of your day, everyone. And we look forward to having you join us for future webinars.